So I will introduce um, the three of us here. <laughs> um, so Charlene Fai, thank you. Fai comes from a non-traditional tech background, having first studied law and receiving her LLM in 2012 for intellectual property and competition. Oh, sorry. From the Max Planck Institute for Intellectual Property and Competition Law in Munich. Um, while working on data privacy issues and tech innovations from the legal perspective at Intel Mobile Communications GmbH, she discovered that she would see herself rather on the side of the on the other side of the table and transitioned to coding for change. Currently, she is a core developer for Yolocom GmbH, which is developing an open source blockchain integrated self-sovereign digital identity solution. And Alexis Sellier is the co-founder of Monadic, longtime open source developer. He recently co-founded Monadic's first project, Open Source Coin, a project which aims to create a sustainable economy around open source software. And I'm Liz Steininger, CEO and Managing Director of Least Authority in Berlin. And we're a company that supports people's right to privacy through security consulting and building secure solutions. Um, prior to this, I managed financing for the Internet Freedom for um, Internet Freedom projects at the Open Technology Fund, and I have more years of experience than I'd like to say <laughs> as a project manager and program manager. <laughs> Feeling old this year, <laughs> um, yeah. But so that's us. Um, I was supposed to moderate, but. I think I'll, we'll kind of do a conversation and I'll help to present some, some questions and stuff. But as Angie said, we're here to talk about um, yeah, open source sustainability and how to enable the community to grow in the future. And um, I think we can take it from there in lots of different directions. That is a huge topic of things to talk about. Um, I mean, quickly, how many people here like really feel comfortable with the term open source? Like you know what that means. Yeah, okay, we know what that means. <laughs> Good to know that kind of audience. And um, so as you guys know, uh, you know, a lot of open source software is done in a very collaborative public manner. And the beliefs that drive people to contribute to open source are, are varied. They, there's, they cover a lot of territory. And there's a lot of different types of ways that people can contribute to open source. I think oftentimes we talk about open source developers as if they're some sort of homogeneous group of people. And um, I think we all, if we're familiar with this movement and, and, the, and the software, that we know that um, people vary a lot and the contributions vary a lot. And so I think that that makes the conversation even more complex when we talk about enabling this community um, moving forward. So to get on to our discussion, uh, I think a good place for us to start is to say um, why you are personally and professionally involved in the open source community, um, or the open source movement, and um, why do you think it matters what you're doing? <laughs> so I'm gonna yeah. let you two answer. <laughs> okay. um, so I, I guess originally I started as a developer and um, I was mostly trying to uh, you know, build my own things. Um, and you know you, you you're working as a hobby, so you work, you're picking free software, uh, open source software, and um, and then there's a thing that I'm kind of talking generally, but this is this was my story. Um, there's a thing that doesn't exist, or some kind of issue you have with an existing piece of software, and so you kind of start working on your own thing, and um, it at that point makes sense to share it because you have no intent of uh, selling it or profiting from it. And so, um, you know, that's kind of like the, the first for a lot of people, I think, and for me, it was my for, first foray into open source was actually building something for myself and then putting it out there for other people to check out. Um, and then uh, from there, um, after the, you know, second or third project that I put out there, like one of one of them got some interest. And so it, it was it was solving, solving problems for other people, people other than me. And um, that's kind of how I got started. Like, uh, um, you know, these other developers started to contribute, and I learned a lot from that process. And then um, other people would be users, and they would be asking for uh, a certain feature, a certain bug fix. And so this kind of um, started this whole interest and this whole kind of uh, hobby in the beginning. Um, and 
and then from there, it, it picked up pretty quickly for me where I um, was building more and more things and releasing them for, uh, and I was building them for myself really, but always releasing them uh, in the open until the point where um, I had like these like dozens of projects and I had no time to maintain all of them. And um, some of them were used, some of them were abandoned, some of them I had abandoned. And so it was kind of this uh, unsurmountable amount of work uh, um, that made me feel really kind of bad because I, you know, you have this feeling that you've, you've um, people are trusting you for something and, and you're not delivering and you're betraying uh, that trust by not fixing something or not um, maintaining something. And so this is kind of when this, this whole issue of open source sustainability and, and uh, maintenance and uh, all of that started to, to become uh, a problem of concern for me, like something, uh, yeah, personal. That all sounds very familiar, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sadly. And that's why we're talking about how we can fix it. <laughs> so, and, and you? Um, yeah, I mean, I think mine was uh, half intentional and half non-intentional um, because I think for me, it came a lot from um, having come from law. Uh, I came in from a very large company from Intel. Um, I was really coming from a very uh, structurally, like very hierarchical kind of conservative environment. Um, law also being a very hierarchical and conservative type of field. Um, so when I started realizing that I was interested in coding, um, of course, I had a lot of friends who were programmers. Um, so when we first started, when I first started learning, I was actually learning with the help of them. And then the way that they taught me was uh, via just, you know, normal Git flow. So like they would have projects, they were in the States, I was in Germany or they were somewhere else. And that was the way that they were able to kind of like bring me into the code base and, and teach me. So I was kind of already accustomed to that type of dev flow from the beginning. Um, and then when I started looking for uh, projects that I was interested in contributing to, then um, blockchain and kind of like the decentralized space in general was something that I was interested in more from a political direction than from a tech direction initially. But then I found the tech just to be really inspiring. And because I felt like it's not a stagnant place, you know, and uh, there's downsides for it being experimental and whatnot. Everything's always in beta, but it kind of forces you to always be on your toes and be learning. And it was just the opposite of what I had been. I mean, law, you there's a lot to learn, but things change very slowly, mostly. So, um, yeah, so it was really how I got. And yeah, and the, and the luck part kind of came in because I, I just um, I had I got the job. So. I would say that was <laughs> some luck there too. <laughs> yeah. So, so both of you, you know, had different kind of experiences starting it. But what were your experiences with other contributors, and what do you think about um, like the groups of people and the different types of individuals that make up these these open source projects? And mm -hmm. um, I would say that I probably have also been quite fortunate with the contributors in the sense that. Um, I've heard a lot from people who say that it can be like quite an aggressive place. Um, I find that there's at least depending on the project, but a lot of projects have a very high standard for, um, you know, like comments or like when you make a commit, like what kind of comments you have or like generally how you structure your code because everything is public and, you know, everyone can see it. So you kind of really do want to have only stuff that you mostly are not so super ashamed of. Um, and that's a really good standard to keep. So I think like that level of uh, critique is something that I really like. Um, and yeah, I think the community as such has also been quite supportive in my, in my experience. Um, yeah. yeah it's, it's interesting from like, uh, so from a maintainer's perspective, there's a lot of different kinds of contributors you get and you can immediately tell like if that contributor is also a maintainer or not. Um, based on kind of this um, respect for the work you're doing. Um, some people give you a lot of work when they contribute, a lot of work to do, which seems wrong, right? <laughs> and other people make it easy for you, and that mm -hmm. seems right, because you have, you have to manage a lot of these contributions. Um, and so I think it's it's mostly, yeah, that's been kind of the, the, the uh, two sides of, of my experience has been, on the one side, like really 
kind of entitled people who are like, oh, please, can you please fix this. And, and I, I think part of the problem is, is maybe educational where like uh, maybe that person's company is using the piece of software. They don't even know that it's open source or what open source is or whatever. It's just like, hey, you have a problem with this thing, go to this page and file a bug report, right? And that's like very wrong, I think, like for any company to uh, explain that to their employees, for example. Um, and then on the other side, you have other maintainers of other projects. And so they know how to make the, the work of accepting a change easy. And so they, you know, prepare it and kind of, uh, you know, file, a, if it's a bug report, it has like a, um, a way to reproduce it and, you know, stuff like that. And I think this culture is, um, uh, it's, it's growing or the, the, what I mean is the, um, uh, contribution culture is, uh, is growing and, um, it's no longer kind of ad hoc and you have like, you know, GitHub now has you know, issue templates and stuff like that. And I think little by little, like the community is learning to, to be good contributors eventually, but I think it's still kind of a long way to go before, um, before this process is just more efficient and more mutually respectful, I guess. Do you think that that's achievable, really? <laughs> I mean, so so you kind of talk about um, like these these different levels of um, like familiarity with mm. how uh, an open source community functions, right? So um, and knowing how to how to interact with the maintainer yeah. and um, being being sensitive to the fact that the maintainer might, you know. Yeah have other things to do maybe <laughs> or that it's not it's not like a commercial product yeah. that's being supported and so i guess for for both of you do you think that that's do you think that's a problem that is actually fixable or do you think that that's something that we always have to account for moving forward i mean i think this entire event stream drama you know it shows <laughs> that uh, it's really important to support the maintainers because mm -hmm. these people you know obviously have their lives and i think of course, I have my, my opinions on maybe where the liability is and who, how should have reacted. But I do think ultimately um, there needs to be a lot of work done for, you know, also speaking as a developer from an open source project where we also need to get funded and we also need to get paid. And um, self-sovereign identity, of course, is also a particular field where it is difficult to monetize because you inherently do not want to monetize uh, self-sovereign identity. So I think... Um, the problem of maintaining open source products is definitely really real. Um, I think I don't have like very many good ideas on how we can approach that problem, but yeah, I think it's obvious that it's quite necessary. Well, you both kind of touched upon one thing from different angles, which mm -hmm. is that um, there are these, the, there are these different roles in the open source projects that there are possibly people who are working for commercial companies that are relying on open source mm -hmm. projects. And, um, you also mentioned, um, like the event stream hack. Uh, this is a recent, recent hack that, um, let's see if I can sum this up quickly. Um, <laughs> there are Bitcoin wallets, uh, supported by commercial companies that utilize, uh, an open source library. Um, an open source project that was created many years ago by um, and by a, a very great. I'll just say that because I'm biased because I know him, <laughs> a good developer, and he. Um, I mean, it, like it just like all most op open source contributors, most most programmers, they just um, they develop something for the fun of it. Um, I'm sure I can't speak for him and his personal reasons why I developed it, but he didn't develop it to support these commercial companies with Bitcoin wallets. It was years before that the like. You know, I don't think that that was the intention, but this happens. We see this, we see this happen in open source a lot, and I think that everybody thinks about this hack recently because it's a really great case study of what we see happening, which is somebody develops something for the fun of it as an exercise, something to solve their own problem. They put it out there, like you were saying earlier, yeah. um, for for these different reasons, and but you never necessarily intend to become a product that's going to support commercial companies or something. And then we have commercial companies come along and see that there's open source to use, um, and then they start using it. And, and then they maybe expect some level of like support mm -hmm. um, that we necessarily, we might not be able to give. And so you both touched upon this from, from those different angles that there's different reasons why people are building the open source code that they have out there and different reasons for um, using it. I mean, and, one thing. I'm sorry, yeah, no go. <laughs> one thing I can say from the law side is licensing is super important on the code base because 
like I know at Intel when I was working there as a lawyer, um, we like actually read the licenses of all the open source code we use really carefully because uh, there it's called viral licensing in in that uh, field. And yeah, like if you have LGPL or any kind of a lot of the GPLs, um, they will definitely consider very carefully how they use the code and for what purposes. And also, um, yeah, so I think like this is just a bit of a non sequitur, but yeah, it's it's like really important to carefully consider the licensing on the code base. I'd like yeah. to talk about licensing actually maybe after. Okay. Um, I have like a, a, a question, but uh, just to close the topic, I guess, on the, the different communities and the contribution. Um, another interesting kind of dimension to this is that, okay, you have like perhaps the new contributor and the old time contributor and, and that kind of spectrum. But then there's also the fact that we're like in a, in this like connected community now with GitHub, especially, mm -hmm. and all these different, uh, sub communities, like, uh, um, you know, around each project has a very different culture also yeah. and different language, different way of communication, different, uh, um, guidelines, uh, you know, a different person in charge or like a benevolent dictator who may be a nice person or not a nice person. Right. And all these different things. And it's quite interesting because, you know, there's, there's not a handbook for this or anything like that. In general, you kind of, uh, you know, if, if you have a contribution you need to make on a certain project because, um, because you're using it and it's your first contribution and you're, you're maybe a maintainer, very experienced, but you go into this thing and you're like, you start to, to try to find, okay, how do I contribute to this? You go through the process and it can be very like alienating in, in certain cases because you have these, these like kind of micro communities that are um, very well, very well aligned internally, but they're very weird from the outside. You know, they're, they're just so used to each other and mm -hmm. to their own ways of working, but they're not at all inclusive or like they don't, um, uh, they're not open really to outside. And this is, this is also something I don't know if there should, should even be a solution to this. Uh, and if there should be, then what it would be, because you also don't want to, have all of these communities be homogenous, right? Mm -hmm. Like this, you know, it's, it's like, you know, Linus Torvalds and like uh, the Linux community, like you can say what you want from, uh, of, of him, but, um, you know, it's well managed, right? It's, it's some, it works within its, um, its sphere. And as much as he's like perceived as an asshole on everything, um, uh, it works, right? And so do you want, like, should we put someone else in charge or not? Like, how do we deal with these kind of things? Or and, and like I, I see it a lot. Like there's always like uh, the backles with like uh, you know conversations that end up like stirring something with one of the maintainers, something like that, and then it, it gets on Twitter, and then um, it's it's really interesting because um, I mean yeah I don't know, I don't know what, what do you think like uh, of what aspect? So like like is there a sense in um, having a kind of more homogenous or uh like a structured or yeah consistent or like approach across these projects either that but i don't want to like propose a solution really but like um Why? i don't know Sh should should these communities be more open to the outside or um should they just should the outside just not contribute to them you know it's like <laughs> <laughs> well i mean I'll say that I'm not sure that like the, I mean, they can't totally close themselves off to the outside. Yeah. Um, especially when it, I mean, to, to take a, a different angle when it comes to like users, like the, the end people of all this technology mm -hmm. that like, we don't run just a phone with only Linux on it. Yeah. Like there's all kind like there's all kinds of stuff on our computers and all these different projects need to interact for products that are built on top of them. And even just run our machine. Yeah, so in, in a sense, they're they're forced to yeah. kind of inter interact mm -hmm. with the outside. I think. Yeah. And I mean, I think if you talk about a code base, it depends on how high level or low level you want to go, right? Because if you're talking about, for example, like um, like a Go code base, where like the the structure of the language itself will inherently mean that the code will look a lot more all the same. Whereas yeah. if you're talking about JavaScript code base, then of course there's different styles and maybe the style has developed within this code base and people don't don't write things a certain way. And but like so I think on that level, I don't know if this is what you're talking about more or if you're really talking more about um, 
Because what hey, I like, read... I think, yeah, if, if you think of like, for example, codes of conduct, right? Like some projects have them, some don't, some have very specific ones, some have, mm -hmm. you know, and so it's like the way you conduct yourself in these different communities is different, mm -hmm. yeah. right? So different things are accepted in some communities or not. <laughs> and like, this is, I don't know, this is, I guess there's no kind of mm -hmm. um, specific question, but I just find this interesting that... Perhaps it, there's something in the middle where there can, I, I think that, I mean, I, I think that sometimes these, um, these, the differences in the community stem mm. from the differences in the, the purpose, the, the, the programming language, the, the different, there's different kinds of like history that causes them to, yeah. to grow a particular way. And perhaps some of that should be modified because perhaps some of that is not, you know, could be course corrected, but some of that maybe needs to be there for a reason. Um, you know, it's a weird analogy, but to think about like human languages, like um, the way that like English sentences are structured versus German sh sentences are structured are very different. And so the way we think in those two different languages is kind of different for a reason. And but yet we can still translate the languages. And so maybe um, in these open source communities, would it be possible to that to, to allow them to have some differences that are like inherent necessary for for what they're doing, but to then maybe find a way for them to, I don't know. And maybe like further on that point, which is like, I guess I want to understand is, um, are you like, okay, there's of course going to be different communities, but are you trying to say that the differences in the community inhibit the development of, of a like a quality code base? I, I think some, some community communities can be close to outside contributors, which would inhibit the quality of the code base. And then the question is like, do you change the community and throw out the people that make it hard for outsiders to come in but or do you that, keep it as is is right? that link like for sure yeah. that closing it to outside contributors no that's that's what's tricky i guess is that some like and and when these things happen like you can like the projects take either one course either it's like no we keep things the way they are mm -hmm. this person who's misbehaving or has been like uh, not nice stays on right and everything stays the same because you know or, um, no, let's kick this person out, or let's change the, the code of conduct, or let's change the way we communicate because mm -hmm. we want these people, these outsiders, to be insiders, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, because, like, I am I guess, like, maybe everyone in the blockchain space or whatever, like, governance is the hot topic these days. It's right? Yeah, it's related uh, to that. Yeah, and for me, like, the question you're asking here just reminds me a lot of the conversations about, um, yeah, governance, on-chain, off-chain, what should it look like? How do we govern who, our communities? Exactly, and yeah. who has a who has a role to play mm. in governance or who can participate? Um, and yeah, applied to open, like a code base, I think like um, if I'm thinking about governance, for me, it's always important to consider the goal towards which we're optimizing. And like there was this recent cut podcast from um, Anna Rose, right? this one with Vlad and, and Gavin at one point said um, that he thinks the optimization goal of, uh, of governance should be um, to keep the nation whole, like if the metaphor is mm. for nation states or whatever. In this case, that. yeah, exactly. And I thought that was really interesting yeah. because I'd never thought about that as the optimization goal for governance, at, not so concretely. So, like, if we were to think about a good governance for open source code base, like, I don't know what you guys think would be a good optimization goal. Hmm. I think it, I, I think it probably depends on the community and what the community is is, is gathered around and why they're building it, right? So, um, I mean, this is probably there's probably some variance, but maybe there are some things that we know are good optimizations, <laughs> um, like being perhaps being too insular is a bad thing that you do want outside people sometimes. Mm -hmm. Uh, but maybe it depends on the community of how they want the this new contributors to to join. Yeah, but I mean to speak. Uh, let's bring it back to sustainability. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. Could how do these governance how how could different governance perhaps um, you know better help sustainability? And maybe it would even help to just quickly say that sustainability means both maybe for financial, but also um, like. The, the life of the project and um, and what the project needs to support it beyond itself. So sustainable in the sense of funding, sustainable in the sense of continuing, sustainable in the sense of supporting whatever's depending on it. So what do you think about governance and sustainability? Um, I think that... 
I don't know, because half of me wants to think that if there's the financing there, that it will continue. Yeah, because <laughs> that, that kind of seems like always the biggest obstacle. Um, but like, but I'm not really sure. Um, because then you have like the form of financing, if there's strings attached, if there's no strings attached. Let's talk about financing then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you think about financing open source projects? Um, uh, financing always comes from somewhere. And that somewhere always has an intention for the financing, I think. So, I mean, I think I, I think it's naive to say that it never comes that it comes with no strings attached. So, so is is there a way to? I mean, okay, you brought financing and governance, and to me, like they they could be. Um, you know, it, it could be that, okay, obviously with, with financing, you have uh, facilities, like it's, it's easier to, to run a project with resources than without. But um, another way to think about it would be to, to say, is there a way that we can get more contributors and maintainers um, to, and to incent them to, to, to help out on this project by non-financial means, mm -hmm. right? And, and perhaps that's much more complicated as in it requires uh, a much bigger effort or a much more continuous effort or... But what um, would those means look like? Just, well, so, so bringing it back on this kind of openness thing, like, it, uh, you know, maybe just having a project that um, is easier to contribute to will mean more contributors and these contributors may turn, turn into maintainers, which happens sometimes. And then, you know, you have a project that has enough momentum that... Um, uh, that once the, the first maintainer is burnt out, the next one can take over. <laughs> <laughs> that seems quite sustainable. But you very good. I mean, <laughs> but to clarify, you mean that they're not, they're, they're all volunteers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah. so nobody's yeah. paying them to yeah. do all that work. Yeah. Okay. I mean, some projects work like that. Obviously, it's, you know, it, it's not always sustainable, but I think it's, it's a, uh, possible outcome yeah and we could clarify a bit too where yeah. the what it means to get paid to do a project too um there's some difference there that you could have a project that has money to directly pay people but you can also have companies and other organizations that are funding developers to contribute to a project so the project isn't directly yeah. paying for them but people are getting paid to contribute to their project <laughs> and that's that i think is much more common or that that happens quite a bit and it's kind yes. of i wouldn't consider a project like that being financed as in it's it's not. It's definitely not sustainably financed. Yeah. Uh, and it's more that a company has a specific interest for a specific feature or something like that, and they'll have like a one-time thing. But that's not enough on its own to support the project, right? You mm -hmm. still need like volunteer work at that point. Yeah. Yeah. I think you can always like bisect or segment financing into a couple different uh, categories, right? Because mm -hmm. you have like, or you can think about the code base as you have the main code base. Um, which needs to have the core team and it needs to be maintained at all times to perform its basic functionality, whatever the case may be. And then you have like the features, which maybe some companies want, like what you were talking about. And those then can be incentivized differently, like in bounty form or maybe even in like volunteer form. Um, but I guess maybe my overall opinion on financing is that I think there always needs to be that base of financing there, at least to create like the sustainable core, because I think otherwise it's, um, it's not that I don't think it's possible, um, but I just think it's very difficult to create otherwise like a continuous, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, a continuous like uh, um, consistent curation. Yeah. And we can, we can also add into that, that financing mix. Um, when we say that people are volunteering um, to do effort on open source projects, they are being financed in another way too. Like they need, they need roofs over their heads and food on their table. Some, but somehow they're making, somehow they're providing for themselves and they're just not doing it through the open source. So they're being financed somehow. So there's like these, these levels of indirectness, but at the end of the day, we all need to eat. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately or fortunately, but um, yeah, so I think um, even the voluntary thing uh, we need to, and, and I think this plays into the consistency part, which is that if those 
those people who are volunteering initially are consistently financed in alternative ways to like, and they consistently have time to, so you could possibly have that sustainability, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's about the people behind the projects and mm -hmm. that need to be financed to live. And, um, so I think that that's a, that's an, it's, it's a difficult, it's a difficult part that, that, yeah, we all talk about these projects, mm. but it's people. Yeah. yeah. So maybe that helps to think about that. How people. fun people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I really like the, the recent shift towards like, um, like Patreon type models, for example, mm -hmm. where it's, it's, to me, it's more about the person because, okay, there, there's, that person is doing some projects, but um, it's kind of like a campaign kind of mm -hmm. thing rather than like, hey, I'm going to donate to this specific repository or like project. It's kind of more like, oh, I'm someone who is producing goods mm -hmm. over time. And so I need funding over time mm -hmm. and I have a following and this following uh, like supports me yeah. with donation, like recurring uh, payments and that kind of thing. Like I, that's more humane to me or like it's going towards something more sustainable. But on um, the other flip side mm. of that, maybe, is that if you have a reputation-based financing scheme, then you kind of maybe inadvertently create the scenario you're, you were trying to avoid before, which is that, um, you know, not everyone can enter because some people are, are more, more well-known than others. Or like the cult of personality and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. I don't true. know if you, if you... Yeah. Yeah. So, so barrier to entry would be... Yeah. funding to like having the bandwidth that, that like if you're a person and you need to somehow you want to start contributing to an open source project how do you sustain yourself while you're doing that yeah or, or like or how do you get in to do that yeah so um yeah let's so so sustain it so we let's talk about other types of funding too so we talked about mm. funding individuals through um through uh the like the patreon method mm. um the other types of funding, like commercial companies like funding open source. Kind of, what? Like sponsorships and that kind of thing. Yeah. So what do you guys like, think about those? What do you think about commercial yeah, companies having interest in open source projects? I think it's great, but uh, <laughs> um, it, it, it does have a downside um, in that this company that has its own kind of agenda, um, which is often not the same as the original agenda of the project or of the other open source users or de developers or dependencies um, may stir the project in a direction that is not the right direction for the project mm -hmm. because it has too much control. There was a, pro there was, this happened to a project recently, I, f I forgot what it was, but um, the sole maintainer was hired by Google or one of, one of the big, big companies. And, um, but it wasn't, clear to anyone and this project ended up completely being repurposed um, without any notice or anything and the the community it was a very small community but they were they were yeah pretty unhappy mm -hmm. even just for, uh, about the lack of transparency that this was happening and that this project was taken over and this is like the extreme case but i think in in the less extreme cases it's sometimes worse because it's on bigger projects right um, on, on the flip side, like for, for example, for Linux, I think it's worked out quite well from my kind of understanding and that, um, again, Google and other big companies are contributing a lot of great patches and it's partly because of the GPL, I think, but um, partly because it's open source and um, also partly because of Android. Um, and yeah, that's, that's really, really good. But my fear is that that becomes the standard model uh, because if that if that's what happens, then uh, companies control open source at that point, right? And the, yeah. they control some of it through yeah. like. Well, through if they effort. control the financing of it, they kind really. of control. Yeah. In a way that the 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 lifeline, you know. But do you mean like that if these companies leave, then the the project will die? Yes, so exactly. They make like, themselves dependent. I mean, once once a. Once a product starts to take financing, I think it's hard to stop taking financing, right? Like if, because then you start just to depend on it and uh, maybe you, you hire an extra person or you have a fancier website or you, you know, um, and then you're dependent on this, this financing. And then, and it's, it's always kind of an unspoken um, agreement, which is also tricky. 
as in um, companies always obviously try to play nice, right? They're not going to be dictators or anything like that. But you have an understanding that if you say no, or you don't really do the thing that would be in their best interest, they may just lose interest in this project and start, you know, fork it, finance something else. Or um, so there's definitely some some kind of unspoken agreement there. Um, and so sometimes it's more it's it's even more uh, explicit in that yeah a company just hires the the team behind a, an open source project and then mm -hmm. yeah I mean yeah I think that like like I said before I feel like uh, like you're right that there's always an agenda with financing um, I think that. For a team who's considering financing from corporate from corporate uh, sponsors or whatever the case is, um, like there, I think that you can take financing in ways that don't let your that that you don't become dependent on it. Mm. Or and then on the flip side, you can also view it like um, if it was if it was like a, a private company type of not like open source code base, but rather like a com a company with a product. Um, to remain competitive in a market, you always need like multiple sources of funding also. So, and I'm not Diversity. trying to say, yeah, I'm not trying to say like, um, you know, open source be like private market, but maybe also there's things that can be learned from like how to remain competitive in a mm -hmm. market, right? Yeah. Like if, you're, if your code base is just really good, then the company is not going to want to stop using your yeah. code. Mm -hmm. So, so actually, this this brings me to the to the question I had on, on licenses or the kind of topic I wanted to. Um, I'm not a lawyer no, anymore. No. <laughs> Disclaimer. <laughs> I think it's licenses and sustainability. Go. <laughs> yeah. So, so on this topic of competitiveness, right? Like, there's this very interesting model that has started to to spring up, which is kind of what I would call like a, a dark pattern in, in the sense that it's. Yeah, you'll, you'll understand. Um, so, for example, uh, MongoDB. Okay, everyone, most people know MongoDB. It's a popular open source database. They um, are now, I think, transitioned or have transitioned to a, a license that's um, pretty much similar or the Afero GPL, which is essentially saying that uh, if you are using this piece of software in any capacity to provide a service, then that service must also be licensed with that license and be open source, right? So, effectively, like all of the um, these companies that say like, oh, hosted uh, Postgres or hosted MongoDB, hosted Redis, like all these all these things, they would not be able to do that anymore and make money out off of it, right? Now, the problem is, even if you're offering a service that is not the database itself as a service, but something um, it's, you know, some other service, like for example, Google Cloud offering the cloud service, um, the the legal risk is too high to even consider um, including this database anywhere, even not directly as a service, mm -hmm. right? And so Google, for example, refuses to uh, use any software that's licensed with a Faro GPL, right? Now, here's the the dark pattern, as as I called it. Um, the the reason it seems uh, that they that MongoDB is doing this or Tengen the company behind them is that they are going to then offer a uh, uh, a very expensive license to a company like Google and whatever that gives them the full rights. So they're they're open source um, with this license, but then they're kind of um, licensing their software uh, in a non open source way. Um, so would people argue that so, then that's not really real open source? Yeah, it's 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 a trick. <laughs> but okay, but I feel like um, maybe I'm not understanding the licensing mm. terms correctly. But I feel like it's actually kind of a good idea because if you accept their licensing terms, then you are also bound to, I assume, open source mm. licensing. Yeah. Um, so that means all projects who are open source can continue using their code base, but then the ones who are proprietary have to pay a lot of money, which somehow it makes sense, but yeah. maybe I was interested in something. It, it does make Punish sense, but, <laughs> but essentially, it's, it, it essentially is a license that 
almost no company can use. This is the problem, I think, with it. It's very risky legally. I mean, it's the same. It, it's, it's like the GPL kind of, mm -hmm. but much, much, much worse. Like already GPL, like some companies are a little bit like, no, we're not going to use this. It's a bit like we don't want to be in that territory. Um, but with, with, the, with the AGPL, uh, it's, it's even scarier because it's more, it's not just, oh, you, you link to this thing. It's like you are use, uh, using uh, to, to provide some kind of service of any kind. And so this, this is almost okay. like... But what are they scared of exactly, the companies? Um, to, to be sued, essentially, right? <laughs> so this is not an answer to sustainability. Right. No, <laughs> we're not proposing this, right? We're against no. this. <laughs> no, I mean, I think it's, uh, yeah. No, we're, we're not, we're not <laughs> proposing this. Um, I, I just find it interesting um, in, in the concept, context of what you brought up about competitiveness, because they are a very competitive, like, open source company, right? And there's a, there's a bunch of other ones, like Canonical is one of them. Like, these, these um, powerhouse open source companies, in a sense, that are very, very, um, they're like sharks in a sense. And they, uh, they are part of the open source community in, in a way. They have open source software, um, but they are almost exploiting the idea of it in a sense and profiting from it um, like, um, like for-profit companies. I mean, they are for-profit companies, but you know what I mean, like prepared to companies. Mm -hmm. I guess, like, I I just am still a bit unclear on the um, on the terms of the AGPL, mm. and mm. if that means that the companies who use uh, their code license mm. under AGPL necessarily then have to release their products also under AGPL. Is it something like that? It's the yeah, it is something like that. It's a, it's a viral one, I guess. The, yeah, the, yeah. yeah. The, the problem. The problem. Yeah, yeah, it's a copy left license. Yeah, okay. Yeah. The problem about it, I guess, is that it's always the language is is uh, ambiguous, right? Enough that um, you can't for sure know that you're safe. Unless you are also right. copy left, then you're safe. Unless you're copy left, exactly. Yeah. So, so what license do you think is good for sustainability? I have no idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> we could do a whole panel on that too, <laughs> talking about just licensing and open source yeah. and what how licenses contribute to to sustainability too. So, um, it, oh, how about we'll, we'll change directions and go back to uh, Angie gave a quote earlier from Nadia, um, who uh, so Nadia Egbal, I think I'm saying mm -hmm. her name right. She um, she did a paper called Roads and Bridges, and it was funded by the Ford Foundation. Uh, about about like the, infra the open source infrastructure that we all depend on. And um, this is the opposite of what we were kind of talking about, where companies are overly influencing projects through funding. The opposite is, what about companies overly relying on open source projects and not funding them at all? And this is where the roads and bridges kind of reference comes in, that there's this infrastructure that exists out there that's open source, that and this is actually tied to the event stream type of example too, where it's like there's core open source piece projects out there that are being utilized by commercial companies, people, all kinds of things. They 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 become the roads and the bridges of the, of our digital worlds, and there's nobody directly funding those projects, or those people are they're just you know they've got a good full time job and so they're doing it on the side, <laughs> or they're not doing it on the side because they're busy doing something else and these projects aren't being maintained properly um, to no fault of the contributors, but just the nature of this, that again, they're people. Um, and so what do we do about this infrastructure and finding sustain sustainability for that infrastructure? And how do we, um, yeah, how do we, uh, how do we move forward if we want to see open source continue to exist? How do we move forward to make sure that infrastructure is supported? I mean, it would be super cool if someone built an immutable database where you could record <laughs> contributions and, and see when the code has been used. Ah, and then pay the people. <laughs> exactly. No, I don't know. So like I mean, a tax. Is that what you think? <laughs> no, I mean, it was... Like uh, if, you, if you use open source code, if you use this open source code base, you have to pay a tax to the, to I mean, the project. I think probably the registry is a good start. Right, just, just register, just to track um, who's actually using, and then add a band like go ask them for money. 
<laughs> or not ask them for money. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I would have to think about the effects of that on the ecosystem, but yeah. at least the registry is a good, probably a good start. So you think registering maintainers, or registering projects used, is that a registry it? of, yeah, just like data flow, data okay. usage. Hmm. Okay. How about you? Yeah. I mean, I think like in a world where everything is sort of monitored, that would make sense. Yeah. Um, but I think otherwise, <laughs> is <it> everything monitored. <laughs> well, it is, but we don't have access to that data. We should ask the NSA for, for help with the problem. So the NSA needs to create a registry. <laughs> exactly. Done. Our panel's over. <laughs> we solved the problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but other, otherwise, it's tricky, right? Because uh, yeah. Yeah, because this it's because it's open source again, so it's hosted in all kinds of places, mirrored in all kinds of places. You can just quickly download it, um, use it. Um, so it's it's not clear to me if this would require like if this is like a kind of code of honor kind of thing where it's like, hey, um, I think uh, LA you sent me something uh, like this the other day where this project was open source and they had a. Right, they were saying, um, or the, ma the maintainer was saying, if you want to open an issue, you need to support me on Patreon, for example. Mm. Right, so this is kind That's of an interesting idea. Yeah, and um, and then you you know you, you you could see in the issue creator, you would have to specify who you are on Patreon, and then maybe if you have to if you use it um, also or whatever it is. But um, on the one side, there's like, and that the, is a governance choice, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, so on the one side, there's this code of honor thing, which is like, we're not, you're, you're not in legal trouble if you don't say that you're using this, um, but please do if you want to support this project. And then the next step is like, okay, like there's a license, again, going back to licenses, but um, which is like, you can, <laughs> if you use this for commercial, this is commercial step, use. Right? <laughs> no, I'm not even that interested in licenses, <laughs> I think. I mean, anyway. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but, but the next thing is like, controls, I'm sorry. <laughs> controls are welcome. Um, <laughs> the, yeah, the, the next phase is you need to pay a fee if you're licensing the software. And, and this is kind of the, the shareware model or the, you know, now everything is like, like Microsoft Office, you don't even like own it anymore, right? You just pay a fee for using it. Like yeah. Photoshop, like all these things have moved to these models because they're, you have this recurring payment and you end up making a lot more money as a business. Um, so I don't know. Uh, like which of these you have in mind in terms of usage is it is it um like i mean uh, or is I, it like even 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 more automated would be like um every time you use a piece of code some other piece of code is triggered which debits mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, wallet. if we can exclude the yeah. entire privacy issue, which yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, that <laughs> yeah, that's like a bad one uh, that we don't want to get into. But okay, assuming there were uh, pairwise yeah. like throwaway, you know, yeah. um, I don't know. Like I, I personally am not really sure. I'm against the idea of usage based uh, mm. charge. Like in the sense, like I know you, you kind of phrased the Microsoft Word or like that you don't even own it anymore mm. and you don't pay. But on the other hand, I kind of feel like the idea of like, I have bought this and this is mine and now I use it is also a bit like based on a concept of property that may not necessarily mm. um, hold true to uh, how we use things nowadays. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's, that's actually a really good point like yep. with regards to sustainability because um, maybe one problem is that people just own stuff and then that stuff needs to be maintained forever from that point. But once you bought it, you don't contribute to it anymore. Yeah. And so if, if it was more of a... Like, like you've a, exited the ecosystem yeah, and you have it. But exactly. if you don't exit the ecosystem, yeah. but you're still invested then, or yeah. like you still have like a stake or something, then you have some sort of reason why you have to keep, yeah. keep contributing. Yeah. I, ironically, though, these models <laughs> are used by big for-profit companies mm -hmm. and not so much by small... Uh, but maybe we can't or blame open the source model. Companies. Like maybe no. the model yeah. is maybe the model's the right, thing. but yeah. we need to apply it yeah. to new to yeah. the smaller projects. Yeah. yeah, and maybe of course, like the models, like as they are used now by the big projects, are flawed in a number of ways. But maybe there's a way we can use that model of like financial flow, um, but make it privacy preserving and mm. make it you know like micropayments friendly, or might make it like. Uh, a way that is somehow more uh, like in line with how our architecture works now. I don't know. 
Yeah, I mean, this this was kind of what I was hoping for with um, yeah digital currencies, cryptocurrencies, is that micropayments are easier. Um, you don't have to go through the bank every time you like pledge some money for an open source project or something like that. Um, but to be seen when that mm-hmm. <laughs> is built. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. TBD. So what do you guys think is the, the, the most pressing problem that needs to be at least discussed, potentially solved in 2019 when it comes to open source sustainability? What's the fire you feel <laughs> that needs to be that needs to be like put out, needs to be solved, fixed? For, for or me, at least talked about. Yeah, maybe not so much like something bad happening, but something good not happening. Um, so I, I feel like there's um, maybe like not a very good allocation of resources. So if you just kind of look like if you could take a very uh, far away look at all open source um, and you know how much each of them has in terms of, of monetary resources, in terms of people, in terms of that kind of stuff. Um, I think it would be probably very, very concentrated on a few projects mm-hmm. um, and you would have like a lot of the stuff we use daily that has zero or nothing and that's kind of a float because people are you know, passionate and doing volunteer work but um, I, I think the allocation of resources is, is probably uh, very concentrated in one place. Do so you think we should talk about it in 2019 or we should do something about it? Mm. Um, I mean, I mean we, you got to start by talking. We should start by, exactly. <laughs> you got to plan, We have to right? start somewhere, yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's okay if we just talk. <laughs> yeah. And then the, the next thing after talking would probably be like um, to think about how do we allocate it? Not, not, not physically, but as in like um, through what means do we uh, potentially agree on, you know, how, like moving this allocation, who do we talk to, you know, who, who's, um, I, I think the problem right now is uh, there's, first of all, there's no clear view of where money is allocated. There's no one place through which it's allocated. So it means like there's like donations received through like PayPal, there's like uh, company sponsorships, there's all kinds of things. Um, I think Open Collective is doing a good job, for example, in terms of making that more transparent. But uh, like besides that, it's pretty unclear. You, you can't just take an open source project and look at its finances, right? Um, or at least, I don't think, unless they have a foundation, et cetera. But, um, so it's already not clear where there is money and where there isn't. Well, it's clear where there isn't maybe, but not where there is. And uh, <laughs> um, having that understanding and then starting to think about where we would like to allocate money where money isn't present. Um, yeah, I would, like, I would like that to start happening. And how about you? What do you think about 2019? I don't even know. Um, <laughs> I don't. I feel like I can't give a very good answer right now about like the most pressing thing. I do agree that funding is obviously well, then, like. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, no. You should finish funding. Yeah, I, I, I think you know, like there needs to be more money um, in the commons than there is like right now, but. That's kind of just, I don't know, it's kind of a vanilla answer. So maybe then a better question would be if you were to, is there anything that you want to make sure that everybody hears right now? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, what a pressure. Uh, no pressure. License your code bases correctly, please. <laughs> there you go, actually. <laughs> Licenses matter. Licenses matter. No. Um, I don't know. Like, I feel that, um, I don't know who here is in the blockchain space. Maybe well, we can turn this into people? a bigger conversation right now. Yeah. Too. A lot of people. Bigger conversation. Yeah. yeah sure. All of you guys jump in. Yeah. I'm, I'm just, yeah. Okay. It's not an answer. It's more of a question, but it's because of open source. Like, um, I'm kind of curious as to the prominence of open source in the blockchain space is just like, I mean, you basically are not really credible as a project mm. unless you're open source, obviously for a number of good reasons. But that has also, I think, changed. I don't know if it has, or my theory is that it has changed kind of like the role of open source in the general larger like mm-hmm. um, tech community. And I'm just wondering like if this, if, uh, if you guys see any repercussions from this and like what blockchain has done for open source, or maybe it's just something that I'm in the blockchain bubbles. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But 
I mean, it's fair. Uh, we see many more boundaries, for example, because a lot of the problems are put in government now. Yeah. <laughs> You're saying then they find, they do my back overtures, right? It's kind of like a brainer. But I think it's more exciting from a cultural standpoint that all of these new developers on the open space, yeah. now they're taking over for granted because now computation is over. Yeah. So, yeah, because I have only ever, for example, worked on open source projects mm -hmm. in my very short <laughs> development career. But yeah. Um, yeah, on, on the flip side, though, it's it's funny to see. Well, it, it's what's interesting is that the the blockchain projects that are funded are often kind of self-funded, or as in like um, you know, stuff like founders reward and those kind of things. Um, or ICO? yeah, I, sorry. <laughs> that, that, that 2017 word. Yeah, <laughs> no, like this this idea that you know they're making money off of their own tokens, mm -hmm. right? And self funded it, sounds nicer. <laughs> I know. Um, and so this, but like it, it's sort of limited in extent to that project. And like, yeah, there, there may be like more bounties, but it still seems like the 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 the, the, the research or the money is not going very far. There's a divide. Like, I see a divide in right? the open source mm -hmm. world. Okay. To answer your yeah. question, that I see that there uh, there are some there are some people and projects that are crossing those two worlds. But there's like the the open source world pre blockchain and ICOs. <laughs> there's like the that that world too. And um, yeah, there's a, there's a bit of a divide. Um, but I also I also am in different like sub communities of those, and so I think it also depends on like which sub because the open source community is not one community really. Yeah. It's lots of little communities that sometimes overlap, sometimes don't, depending on the roles of the contributors in those various communities. So, do you think there's like important lessons that those two could learn from each other? Definitely, yes, like, like yes. What? Um, well, I, I'm, I'm pretty biased coming from like more of the security and privacy sides of stuff, but I think that they can, yeah, I think there's, there's, and so there, there's a clear overlap around some of those, some of the core things in those spaces of like cryptography and, and things about privacy too, that there's, there could be more, um, crossing over, I think that could be helpful. And so, um, but, the, but there's a, there, it's interesting. There is a, there is a divide and there are people who, who cross it. And I think that, yeah, it'd just be really great to see more of, and I don't know if that's necessarily real, real, how, if it, maybe it indirectly is reallocation of funds somehow. Mm -hmm. um, but to see them, to see those communities interacting more, I think would be beneficial. Um, yeah, but they, they each, there, there is some bias on each side, but I think that's normal of most communities most communities think like it's yeah. kind of a natural human thing to think yeah. that like the way me and my community do it is better yeah. than how you and your community yeah. do it i mean and so, like delineation is a line right yeah yeah but at the same time it's also really diversity is great so it's really yeah. good to have those conversations of oh how are you doing this how uh, maybe we could learn something from that and um yeah i i think i i, I think that um now that some of the, the hype, <laughs> now that we're in the crypto winter, they say, <laughs> but some hype has died down, I think perhaps we'll see more bridging of the communities because I think the hype turned people off. Mm -hmm. Understandable, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So again, opening up, yes. <laughs> I think one specific learning is, if you have a mic, you're allowed to talk. Um, <laughs> no, one specific learning is if you only because you have the funds, if you don't have the tools to put them to good use, that mm -hmm. doesn't mean anything. And I think that speaks to your point, like there are all those well-funded um, projects and you don't really see what they bring, what the um, utility is that they bring to the table years into their existence. And to your questions to um, repercussions, um, about things happening in the open. Um, I used to work at a blockchain company before and there is a very real example of an individual contributor employed by the company, but still his name was on the commit set, um, where regarding a very important module about the um, punishing mechanism for validators in the system. So like um, his actual real fear is that he could be held responsible personally if someone loses money from his module punishing someone. So that's definitely a side to that that is vaguely explored, especially when the lines blur, when you have like external contributors and everything like the the whole 
development of the project happens in the open and even down to the project management. So um, you as an individual might be held um, accountable for things that you have done in the name of the company or while you were employed. Mm -hmm. Did you, you guys want to say anything to that? Yeah, it just reminds me of... Uh, the core Ethereum people, you or she? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> who had to quit or didn't have to quit? Yeah. yeah, who quit because he, yeah, didn't want to be accountable for any decision on, a, on a, one of the proposals about the locked. It was about the locked funds, right? Uh, okay. yeah. It, well, yeah. it was among. It was, it was basically related. his managing of like all yeah. of the IPs, but specifically yeah, yeah. that one. Yeah. Um. So he 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 quit because he he. Yeah. It was too much pressure to to be making any decision on this because it affected a lot of money and a lot of people, yeah. yeah. So uh, when I hear tragedy of the commons and like reallocation of resources, I think about government. Mm. Um, and I'd like to know what you think about uh, that alternative of having a digital ministry uh, of of digital infrastructure, you say roads and bridges, right? Um, and open source is becoming critical infrastructure. We have just a department like, of transportation. So. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So department of internet. Uh, well, yeah. What about our tax money? <laughs> what do we call it? <laughs> digital digital infrastructure. Right? About what? What about our tax yeah. money to to support yeah. digital infrastructure like it supports physical infrastructure? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe you should support education of the legislators in digital affairs. Well, well, maybe. <laughs> Super helpful, Step I one. Think, yeah. <laughs> like educate the current in this like government. I mean, it's a, it's an. I think it's an interesting thing to bring up that yeah, we have government agents. I guess it depends on people's opinion of 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 how governments should be, <laughs> how governments should function in our different societies. Um, depends on yeah. your political stance on governments. But yes, uh, to parallel it to other departments, we could have a department to handle this particular infrastructure too. That is one way that, and, and I guess maybe, so maybe we should like, like politics aside, <laughs> like what would that, what would that do to sustainability? Would that help? I mean, there would already be the question of like, which projects would you feel responsible for, right? Because for physical infrastructure, it's easy, right? It's like, it's in your country, but for some open source project, yeah. Was it created like in, where in Germany was it created by a German, uh, or is it, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or is it because it's used by the German government, yeah. or is it used by like hospitals or schools, right? Like yeah. probably that would make more sense. I, I don't remember if w which government like a we couple have years global global yeah. trade agreements about <laughs> <laughs> right <yeah>. internet <laughs> open so, source. <laughs> no, but then either either it's like a, we shouldn't be thinking of of it in terms of a national government. But maybe it's like a worldwide thing, right? Where a bunch of countries like that would make a bit more sense to me, like the UN or something like that, where a bunch of countries get together um, and form an agreement and you know pick a bunch of projects every year that they want to support because they all use it in their own infrastructure. Um, there's some been some. I mean, there's something. At least the core infrastructure initiative is is an example of um, you've seen multiple, but those, that's more of a commercial company thing. Um, some gov governments do fund open source development, but it's not necessarily always infrastructure. It's yeah. for other purposes too. Um, I referenced that I used to work for something called OTF, and OTF would fund um, open source development, and that was government money. Mm -hmm. And there's there's like um, I don't remember if this is Germany or France or both who have uh, like migrated from Windows to Linux for privacy reasons like internally like mm -hmm. as in so so there it makes sense because it's like okay we're this we're using this piece of infrastructure um, we should fund it so that it keeps existing right I wonder that's, if they are funding it yeah actually Does I wonder know? too the government that's <laughs> using open source is funding it. <laughs> anyway all governments are using it but. I'm actually curious about like the reason. Like you say that you think it might be interesting. Do you think it's because you want a Im, like an impartial or somehow neutral party, or like why why do you think a government? But I didn't bring up WSF as a final solution. Mostly, it's an idea that comes to mind when you talk about shared resources, mm -hmm. right? That you know, commercial companies have commercial interests, and a government is not only a commercial interest; that's the interest of people, right? Uh, Right? I mean, but it's, it's part of the responsibility of a lot of governments uh, and to promote shared infrastructure uh, and to promote the, the sustainability of the environment and of the nation state, as you said before, to 
the optimization function is to uh, to stay home, as you said. Mm -hmm. So if if that optimization function could be applied also to modern digital infrastructure and open source, mm -hmm. I think that community could be worth exploring. Uh, and but I agree that there are lots of challenges. And, but, but we do have like I mean actually I think you mentioned environment. We do have like. Environmental Protection Agency in the United States. Mm. I think there's something equivalent in Germany that like countries have these and they're supposed to work together about yeah. helping the, like the Paris Agreement global yeah. environment. <laughs> not, I mean, yeah. not sure how that's working. Takes you out of it. The administration's <laughs> like, we don't want to be in there anymore. So. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, we could all say that, that maybe that maybe that approach isn't working so well because you know climate change. We have a, <laughs> our dear leader is not in favor of environmental progress. <laughs> and there's that. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, one thing that stood out to me a lot when you guys talked before is you seem to have this very negative view on companies influencing open source projects. And that's like, okay, you know, money comes with something attached. But that, like, that seems to me like a very strange way of looking at it. Because let's say you have some open source project and now a company comes and they spend money to influence the project. So like, why do they do that? Obviously because they use the project and you know they have some customers paying for it, right? So there's mm -hmm. a real value there, right? So it yeah. seems like if a company goes and exerts influence on open source project, well, that's good, right? Because it changes and evolves those projects in a way that actually has value. And if you think like, okay, so what, what if there wasn't that constraint and there was just sort of... Free money? Like, so <laughs> how, it doesn't seem that would be a better system. Yeah. And then if you have the idea of, I think, this sort of top-down, you know, world government deciding what code to fund, that seems totally bizarre to me. But you I know mean, what? I uh, oh, sorry. Uh, you know, it, like saying that the government, uh, I'm sorry, that companies influence. Also, the whole idea of having individuals pay for issues to be done is the same thing. Mm -hmm. You're influencing particular work to be done right, through money. Right, right. Anyway, so it's not just yeah. the, it's not just commercial companies that could do that. It's individuals paying through Patreon and stuff too. Sure, yeah, exactly, right. And then as an individual, right? Let's say you as a volunteer work on this project, right? Well, in a way, you're spending your own money, as in your time, right, on on maintaining this project. So, yeah, this also provides like a balance, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you have that, and then you have maybe companies that pay somebody. Uh, exclusively money to work on it. So maybe that's not a, so yeah, maybe, maybe I mean, shouldn't think of that so negatively. Yeah. Like I, I just want to be clear and I don't, I don't think about it negatively, but I just think that it always is the case that there is an agenda behind financing. So it is important to be aware of what the agenda but is. But there's no money, free money. But there is no free money. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it's negative. Um, but I think it's also true, but it's also true people. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that yeah, money's coming from someone. <laughs> yeah. Poor people. So um, uh, just on, on that topic, um, I think maybe the, so it's, 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 to me it's like a neutral thing, but it can turn out to be bad. So it's, it's still better for a company to finance a project than for that project to go without financing at all. Um, but in terms of ranking, in terms of financing methods, I would not, I would put it like somewhere in the middle or, um, but the cases I think that are more problematic perhaps is when a company acquires an open source project, mm -hmm. which is kind of the, the ultimate, like the end, uh, solution for when a, of a company supporting open source and that, like has not always panned out very well. And I think it's just, uh, yeah, just from experience, like it happened with, uh, with uh, Node.js, um, which, okay, was acquired by a pretty good company joint. Um, uh, but then I, I think Oracle acquired MySQL recently. Like there's, there's some cases that are, um, the problem is sometimes the incentives are just completely misaligned with the rest of the community, right? So a company like Oracle acquires MySQL, um, well, they are probably going to want to um, uh, change that piece of software for their enterprise clients, right? So who is that going to benefit? Only these clients, right? And no one else, none of the community, none of the small businesses, none of the uh, rest of the open source community. So this is where I think it's, it's, it can be a bad thing. But, but the example. issue then is not that Oracle buys mm -hmm. the project, mm -hmm. right? but it's that the market doesn't properly work. And exactly. so they can yeah. buy it for less than the actual value because... Yeah. All of those other people that get value somehow it's not yeah. really reflected in it. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's correct. Yeah.
Yeah. Is there another question? So my question about uh, open source and financing is kind of uh, twofold. Uh, first, you kind of alluded to by construction in your conversation about some thesis of open source, about there are certain things that are good for open source or bad for open source. It'd be interested if you stated that explicitly. Like what were your individual beliefs or if you guys are all on the same page? But it'd be, it'd be good to know. Uh, it would frame the conversation in a very different way, I think. And second of all, of all the things that have been done uh, because of open source, like we have uh, the Linux kernel as a very successful operating system, how many things do you think went undone, uh, either because of ec open source or because of the, the ambient economic incentives? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I guess on the first part, what would be good? You mean like more like on the on the financing side or Why in general? Why is MongoDB's <laughs> model yeah. of charging yeah. companies who make money instead of everyone? Yeah. Or they charge yeah. certain people. Yeah. The way they decide certain people. Yeah. Why is that wrong? Yeah. Uh, what would be a model that would be right? What's right? Yeah. Um, I think one thing that's perhaps missing is uh, this kind of, it's what uh, Tomas over there was saying, this, this idea of the commons and this idea that like um, this is shared amongst many, many parties, you know, right? There's a shared interest for uh, not just a certain piece of software, but all, all open source software, right? And the problem is when uh, this interest is kind of, uh, let's say captured by one company that directs it for their own own uh, purposes. So what would be good, I think, is that the governance of open source software and of open source communities was more democratic, I guess, or or at least shared, right? As in more stakeholders and more um, ability to uh, to to make change, right, um, by more people. So, I, yeah, for, for me, it's, it's kind of this, uh, I, I guess the, the problem right now is uh, it's not very transparent the way these deals are made, for example, like the way Mongo sells a license to Google to use, or not to Google, but to use uh, their, their software without the AGPL. Um, it's not transparent how these projects receive money and what they do with that money. Um, sometimes it is, but it's not, it isn't always. Um, and if this process was more transparent and, uh, included more people, um, included more stakeholders, then I think, um, we could have, uh, what I was talking about earlier, which is like maybe a better allocation of resources and maybe more, uh, uh of what you're saying in your second question, like what has not been done, for example, in terms of Linux, um, we'd have more people represented essentially in the process of directing uh, financial resources, right? And so that could potentially lead to a healthier community, or at least where, where more, peop uh, more of the user needs would be satisfied, for example, um, and we'd have just better software, less fragmentation, for example, of, um, of software. Like there's like a million of the same library, of every library, right? It's like, um, and that's, yeah, that's partly, I think, because of lack, because of lack of coordination, because there's, there's no coordination in anything open source except within a project, right? But projects don't typically coordinate going back to the, you know, crypto versus, uh, non-crypto. Um, and, uh, <laughs> I mean, a little bit, yeah, like some, like not completely, but like some kind of coordination between different, either between different communities or within a certain community. Like there's the, the only coordination I ever see is like around like a, either like a package manager or like a, a, the language itself, or like stuff like that, but what not. The, the, like there's Linux mm -hmm. and then there's the distribution. Mm -hmm. so there's the kernel. Yeah. And then there's Ubuntu, yeah. which has yeah. releases. Yeah. And I choose this release we're doing GNOME 2.11 yeah. and X11 14. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of coordinated. Yeah. Versus Within a distribution. Within a distribution. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, yeah, I think that there's a lot of projects that don't get done because people don't also recognize the opportunity for sustainability. They don't know how they could get paid to make it. Yeah. And um, there's not necessarily somebody willing to pay for them to make it, even though the world needs it. 
But um, anyway, I do see glasses are empty. So, <laughs> and people need to stretch. So do you have um, anything you want to add to answer that question? And then we'll close this out. Um, I mean, actually, I have a different answer than you. <laughs> um, Go for it. Yeah. So no, my answer is that I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, the AGPO licensing model. Um, I think that's actually probably a pretty sustainable way to deal with open source licensing and code. Um, because I think it maintains the accessibility of the code, but without a, and maintains the sustainability of the, for the maintainers without like compromising. Um, that being said, I do see like the lack of transparency on financing. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly what I think about it yet. Like, but I'm not sure like if there needs to be more transparency necessarily because I don't also know how I feel about extending the group of stakeholders and governance to mm. all the contributors of a code base. Um, yeah. But that being said, I do think there needs to be a lot of transparency, a lot more transparency on um, design of a system architecture for a lot of these code bases. Because I think if, regardless of like the financing transparency aspect, if there was more, um, if, like, if a lot of code bases um, were able to maybe they just need the time and the money to do it but if they were able to create a very clear like documentation of uh the intentions and kind of like the roadmap and for the system for the architecture of their code base um that would be able to i mean it would be able to um that's what i mean uh, that's what i would feel like would be a good open source uh something that's good for open source if it allows if for like entry of people yeah allows for entry of people it allows for um, easy decision or easier decision making when you're considering receiving support, like financial support from different companies. When you say, compared to our goals here, how does the agenda of this company look? Does it like support? Does it not support? And so I think transparency on that probably for me would be the most uh, like thing that's good for open source. Um, yeah. Well, thank you to my fellow panelists. <laughs> yeah, <thank you>. yes. <laughs> and thank you to the, you all for actually coming on an evening to talk about open source sustainability. Some people in this world don't care about it, surprisingly, but we do. <laughs> and that's awesome. And thanks for you guys uh, hosting this event. So yeah, let's go fill those cups. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.